Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kieran Ryan. Um, I'm coming to you from IBM. And this morning, what I would like to discuss is what we're seeing as the set of requirements that are needed to fulfill a lot of what Mirko was driving towards with his project Sentio, um, and a lot of what Axel was mentioning as well earlier this morning. So um, I've got a, a short set of charts, and I want to take you through the, the lessons we're learning, the observations we're making, and the requirements that we're gathering from the, um, from the industry, from you, and for all of you who put up your hands earlier on as service providers, we are listening. We do want to, um, to understand exactly what you're um, uh, hoping to achieve over the next while. Um, so five years ago, we started on this journey uh, around NFE. And on the right-hand side, there is a set of requirements that we expect to be able to achieve with the, with the drive towards NFE. Um, on the left-hand side, you're seeing that we want to go and exploit uh, cloud-based networking for the purposes of supporting the transformation of your carrier network, for supporting the transformation of your IT and infrastructure, and for the delivery of new enterprise applications, opening up new revenue streams. So all of that becomes enabled through the software-defined world, whether you want to go and deploy virtual compute, which a lot of you have done. That's been done in the industry. Virtual storage. And now we want to begin to look at understanding how we define um, uh, software-defined security. And then into the software-defined network world, into the RAN space. So the intentions here, again, are to support your transformation of your network, your IT, your enterprise, um, and your enterprise applications with the objectives of meeting these goals here on the right-hand side. So number one, five years ago, we talked about cost reduction. Um, we're on a path towards achieving maybe some of that. You are living and breathing that every day. Um, the other one is to understand how we can actually begin to innovate. So we want to drive um, innovation um, and we want to support the innovation to result, to translate that push into the virtual network world and to monetize that so you can actually begin to open up new revenue streams through new partners, through new, uh, new service ideas that you have yourself and for service ideas that somebody else wants to bring to play in, in using your infrastructure. So again, cost reduction, we want to support you open up new revenue streams um, through um, uh, innovation with new services. And as we go down through here, there's another set of requirements that are mandatory for us to begin to think about and deliver with the push towards um, NFE, um, uh, network function virtualization. Um, the empathy that we need to understand, so those of us who are on the vendor side, those of us who are on the service provider side, it is a, it's a difficult, difficult position to be in. Because if I could start at the bottom there and, that, and you see legacy network, because there's a huge amount of infrastructure that is out there. We spent time with our telco customers earlier this year, and we talked to them about the delivery of uh, solutions to support their journey towards virtualized network management. Um, and they said, do not forget about the legacy infrastructure. Do not go storming ahead, and, and you must understand that there will be significant infrastructure in place for a long period of time yet to come. So you've been on a journey to be able to support that legacy network, but then begin the journey to deliver virtual network functions. And you're delivering those virtual network functions sometimes on your own cloud, sometimes potentially on someone else's cloud. So you truly are on the journey to becoming fully hybrid. So you gain the on-prem stuff with your legacy network, which must still be managed, must still be supported. You're transitioning to the virtualized world, and some of that is located, as I said, with you, and some of that is located off-prem in, in other clouds. And that complexity, which is growing, you're not being able to grow linearly necessarily in terms of adding new people, but you have to deal with that complexity and you must bring on board the concept of the service lifecycle management. Um, and that has to be able to support the dynamic management of these services, the rollout of new services very quickly. We heard yesterday from Deutsche Telekom that there's a push to begin to drive for brutal automation. Um, 
across the, the boundary between applications teams and infrastructure teams. And that wall that exists must be broken through to support that rapid innovation, to support that brutal automation that's required. And we see service lifecycle management as one of the tools to support that brutal uh, automation and rapid innovation that's going to be required. Now, this also gives us the ability to think about how do we engage with, our, with the end users much, much differently. So focus on the customer experience and focused on in, in terms of their expectation. What are they looking to achieve? Um, BT had a fantastic story yesterday where there is now someone orders an SD1 and without any contact, the service is delivered to them for the pop-up shop that's required before the, uh, the Christmas holidays in these stores that just become, that happen around this time of year. So again, it's new ways of engaging with your end customers. And again, they are the route towards the monetization of the new services. So you're innovating to support new services to be able to capture those dollars, those euros that are available from these smaller startup companies. So the journey that we see, the requirements that are pu uh, put on you as a business, the requirements that are put on vendors, on partners, etc., is again, to bring down cost and support that rapid innovation through automation. Um, but it cannot be as simple as actual automation of your manual functions today. It must become much, much more um, about machine learning automation. So here's a, a simple picture, right? We cannot scale. As you are facing into a world of, of more and more complexity, um, that integration work that you've been doing, even some of that automation that you're putting in place isn't enough. It's not going to scale. We're not going to be add, able to add new benches of, of people into, the, into our uh, network operation centers, into our service operation centers. So we are required to think bigger. We are required to think about new ways of bringing, for example, machine learning towards automation. And I want to talk about some of that as we get towards the end here. And it kind of it reflects as well what Mirko was talking, as I said, about Project Sentio, that ability to bring new analytics into how you run your, uh, your full environments, your physical environment and your virtual environment. So it's critical that we think differently, we think bigger, and we cannot think the same way before of just automating previous manual tasks. We have to actually begin to automate in a different way. Um, and leveraging new analytics and machine learning. So let's start a quick journey through the next set of slides. So I've kind of given you some context of what we're, what we're, what we're hearing, what we're listening. Um, and one of the things that we're hearing and listening is, is down about in the bottom. There are domains. There are groups within your organizations. And it is foolish for us to expect that it will become one homogenous, team across all of your business. There will all potentially always be these different domains. And these will have, to, these have different requirements around orchestration. These have different dependencies. You will have your, potentially your RAN domain. You will have your IP domain. You may have your fixed network domain. And we want to support um, and we want to listen to customers and say, OK, how are you going to begin to support driving orchestration across these different domains? Because there is shared infrastructure. There is, for example, um, uh, VNFs being deployed into the different domains. And we want to understand how we, do we bring a DevOps approach to this. And I'll mention more about DevOps in just the next slide. But on the top, then, what we're seeing is that there is the, the concept of this service designer. So, We've, we've heard AT&T say this, we heard KPN say this yesterday about becoming software companies. So the service designer can be within your organization, can be outside your organization. And that person is innovating, that person is thinking up and looking at the market and saying, what's the new service that we're actually going to be able to, uh, to monetize here and open up new revenue streams? Um, there is a network engineer who is there today on the legacy network, who is transforming who is worried about their job, who's worried about their role, but they are eager, they're ambitious, they're anxious to go and learn about the new technologies in the new space. So these two teams are starting to come together and it's forcing a unification of OSS. It's forcing the traditional assurance team to begin to work more closely with the 
service delivery team, the service orchestration team, the network orchestration team, the network provisioning. And it cannot be a wall between these two sides. Now, to make a parallel with what we've seen in our own organization in terms of development, traditional software development has meant Java developers writing code, releasing product, doing some basic testing themselves, and then moving that cost to the test team for them to progress to further validation and verification, and then giving it to the customer. And the customer is very often you, who's dealing then with the running of that code, running of that platform, running of that, that management tool to be able to help you do your day job. So in a lot of cases, we've taken that management infrastructure out of the on-prem and put it in the cloud. So now today, our software developers actually have to go and operate the same software for the end user. So that's a, a, a tough transition to make, and we've been in this journey of transition with our customers um, and with our, with our people and saying, when you write the code, you must be prepared to get up at 2 a.m. in the morning, just like our customers have to do, and fix the problem. Okay? So that's the... That's the effort that we're going through to support the transformation, and that's the effort that we see happening here in terms of the unification of the assurance teams and the actual provisioning and orchestration, so you get that unified OSS, that integrated OSS between, as I said, assurance and orchestration. And it gives you this ability to introduce DevOps, and we see the requirement from our, from our customers to have a DevOps mentality, a more agile mentality. Um, some people do not like the term DevOps, um, but it's more, I, I would say, ignore the term. I would say instead of look at the cultural shift that's required within your organization. And we see this infinity loop here, and I've got another two slides just to build on this. Um, but on the left-hand side, at the bottom, you can see the onboarding of the virtual network function. Okay? You can then see, for example, releasing the VNF. So you've got this concept of taking delivery of a set of virtual network functions. We're hearing this from you, that you then need to package these. You need to apply them to your own requirements. You, we have the ability to support the lifecycle model of a VNF, to be able to install it, uninstall it, and we impose that software concepts on top of the VNF that you're bringing into your organization. Stop the VNF, start the VNF. Okay? Then what you want to do is you want to deliver these into a package. So the service designer that you saw before is designing this new service. It's made up of a number of VNFs plus physical infrastructure and to deliver of this, the new service. But you're creating this new service, you're verifying the service, you're testing it, and you're testing it potentially in your own dev and test cloud, maybe internally within your own organization. So you then go ahead and you say, right, I want to now release, I want to install, config, start, reconfigure it, and I want to go around the next loop on the right-hand side, and then I want, when it's deployed and it's in green state, I want to monitor it, I want to diagnose what's wrong, I want to heal it, I want to scale it up. And that is the unified OSS, that is both the, um, the creation of the service, the delivery of the service, and the assurance of the service, and automatically dealing with issues in that service once it is deployed. And that's the brutal automation that we must have the ambition to go and achieve. We must be looking for that scenario where it is your service designer is releasing it, your assurance team are receiving it, and they're putting in place the systems to be able to deal with issues that occur in that particular service, ideally automatically. Because they cannot deal with the growing number of services that you want to release. Is it 500 services in 2018 or 2019 that you want to release? And that's, that's putting pressure on teams that are not growing <laughs> to support 500 new services in the traditional way of growing. So this DevOps loop that we're talking about is, for us, um, it's, it's, it's experience that we have gained in operating our own software, and it's been very challenging, and we see a requirement on your side, and we want to understand and support, um, and we, sh we should see the industry, as Axel mentioned, stepping in to show the love to the service providers in this journey. Because a lot of you, you are not startups, you haven't been born on the cloud, 
you still have the legacy network. That is a big cash revenue generator, but you can't afford to put so many people on that anymore because you need to move over to the side of supporting the growth areas around the new innovation, the rapid innovation, and the brutal automation that needs to be done. So again, we see the challenge of trying to maintain the old and grow towards the new. And that's how we see the DevOps lifecycle being applied to go and achieve that. Um, so just to dive a little bit into that, so the VNF packaging framework, bring your VNFs together, imp, uh, define a service model lifecycle on those VNFs um, that they then have to adhere to and conform to, assemble them into a set of services, and then perform ongoing dev and test in your own cloud on these VNF packages, on these service services that you're rolling out. So that's almost the first half. And then the bottom is really kind of maybe a what a lot of you are doing today. You're bringing them on, you're releasing the VNFs, day zero, day one. You're exploring and examining VNF vendors, deciding on which is the best one, which service to virtualize first, for example, maybe is what some of you are looking at today. But then go the next step ahead and say, okay, how do I want to actually go and bring these together into service, and how do I want to open up APIs to other organizations so that they can assemble services on your behalf? Do you have the skills? We heard yesterday that skills are the challenge in the market. Do we have the resources and skills to be able to drive the innovation, and maybe that ability is outside of our organizations? Um, you then bring in the concept then of the other side, which is the, the, uh, the uh, building it, deploying it, and assuring it. So the orchestration piece and the assurance piece together in the unified OSS. Um, our partner, Acanto Systems, have this, um, this capability around intent-based operations. So you have a service, you want to deploy that service, you want to actually um, understand, the, you know the end state of what that service should be. So it's a journey to go from your current state to the end state. And that intent-based operations is the mechanism for getting there. A human is not going to be able to keep up and implement this fast enough for new services. And the parallel that I can't have looked at is in terms of a, a sat-nav tool, like Google Maps, for example. So you define for Google Maps where you're going, what's the end state you require. Google Maps knows where you are. So no, looking at the infrastructure that's available, the physical and virtual, the service orchestration tool will say, well, that's my end state. How do I get to that point? And along the way, there will be obstacles. Along the way, something that, you, that was thought to be there is not there. And you want to reroute, for example, to achieve the end state. And that's the intent-based uh, operations, different from workflow. Workflow defines, OK, do x, y, z all the time to provision a new service for a, a new customer. Instead, look at it slightly differently. Look at it from the intention of, okay, I need to give this new service to this customer, and the end state is this. How Define how to get there. Online service triage and healing. Monitor. You want to monitor. You want to become proactive. You want to leverage analytics. We saw it earlier on with Mirko just a while ago. You want to learn and, and detect issues early before they become service impacting for that end customer. Um, and you want to be able to support cloud native. The tools must be cloud native, but soon you will be delivering not just a VNF in, in, in a monolithic implementation, that will be a microservice based VNF. And the microservice based VNF has to, the microservices themselves have to be orchestrated, provisioned, understood, and what state are they in? And you need to define the end state that we want to achieve for them. Um, the business benefits that we're looking to achieve. The very top one, I won't go through these, cost, you want to actually have cost efficiencies, cost savings. The bottom one is you want to support an innovation ecosystem. Um, and that innovation, it must be rapid. The brutal automation must support the rapid innovation that's going to be required for, for, for the industry. And the rest, as Mirka mentioned, are being achieved as well. For example, in Colt and Deutsche Telekom earlier on are, are driving initiatives around their partnerships to achieve some of these same business benefits. But it's not without understanding that there are other factors at play, OK? Um, I'll just pick two in the interest of time. So the first one is an inv investment in skills and cultural shift. So yesterday was people, process, and procurement. This is the people. 
we need to start attracting the talent into, the into our companies, into our organizations to support this rapid innovation and security. As we open up our infrastructure and we launch network APIs and we drive automation, we're going to become very conscious of maintaining high levels of security so that we don't have the denial of service attacks. Um, and this journey is a cognitive journey. So I personally have been on the bottom left reactive operations late at night, 2 a.m. in the morning, on my own, dealing with issues, dealing with outages, dealing with switch problems, for example. But we're on a journey towards becoming more proactive, and ultimately we want to become, have, we want to have automated operations. The life cycle management is going to help us deliver automated operations. And finally, I'd like to leave you with a message from our, um, a, a, a service provider in South Africa that it is going to leverage machine learning. It is going to leverage um, um, the, we need cognitive computing to be employed to support this rapid innovation and this brutal automation. Um, and with that, I'd like to welcome you to tomorrow's session to hear from our partner, Acanto, to hear from my colleague, that's Brian Norton from Acanto, my colleague, Dennis Murphy, tomorrow afternoon in the automation operations track where you see examples of how we are delivering on these requirements and how we're there to support and have empathy with you. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll pass it back to Eric.